Hi everyone. I want to thank you for joining us today at our uh, webinar, Driving Innovation Through Modernization. I'm very excited to have you here. Um, what, a, what a great way to uh, round out the middle of the week here with uh, talking a little bit about cloud modernization and, and having some wine. Um, so my name is Rob Duffy. I'm head of solution development at CloudReach and I'm here with uh, Jeff Sternberg. Jeff, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm Jeff Sternberg. I'm a technical director in uh, the cloud office of the CTO at Google. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, and, and we're really excited to um, have this conversation. Um, what we're going to do today is uh, talk about some, some different trends that we see in cloud services. Um, if you go to the next slide, we can see the agenda. And, you know, we'll... Uh, First, I'll give you a bit of an overview of who CloudReach is, what are the kind of things that we do, how we support our customers, uh, and how we are helping our customers not only get to the cloud, but really generate the, the most business value out of the cloud. Um, then we'll go and do a, a wine tasting um, with our winemaker, uh, who's gonna tell you all about the process of making the wine and, and how you know the best ways to pair wine um, and the, especially the sparkling wine, um, I'm really excited to try. Um, then we'll get back and talk some more about some, some cloud trends, right? So we plan on alternating, doing some cloud trends, first migration into the cloud, and then we'll do a second tasting. Then we'll talk about you know, how, how cloud is in the cultural mindset around cloud transformation, how people, are, how people are accelerating that cloud adoption and cloud transformation, and then uh, do one more wine tasting and then have the third uh, cloud trend where we're gonna be talking about how, how people are building to the future. What are the kind of technologies and what are the kind of, um, what are the kind of things that they're trying to focus on as they build to the future. So I think it's gonna be a great conversation with uh, Jeff and I, and then uh, with our with our, mind, our winemaker, Kevin. So uh, if you go to the next slide, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, who CloudReach is and our, our um, partnership that we've had with Google over the last 10 years. Um, we, or more than that now, um, you know, we're going on 11 years with them as a, as a partner since 2010. You know, we are, qualified and managed services provider. So we've been the security partner of the year with Google for the last three years running. Um, we've done lots of projects with the Google team in really our philosophy is about how can we drive a lot of, you know, a lot of cloud value um, to our customers. We look at how, what their business processes, what their business goals are, and then we build our transformation programs around that. Um, and those could include cloud adoption and strategy, cloud management, application innovation, or, or even data. How do we leverage the data that's in those environments? You know, we we've, we've have over 150 certifications in this. We have hundreds of engineers on staff that are, are trained and experts in Google and have experience in delivering these types of services in, in really creating real transformation for our customers uh, all across the globe. We have offices in both um, Europe as well as the US as we, um, you know, to support our customers where they're at. If you go to the next slide. And, and this is our, our services framework. This is how we support our customers. Right? We can provide them with advisory services. And this is really where we start with most customers, understanding you know, what their business needs are. What are they trying to accomplish? How are they trying to transform? Or more importantly, why? Right? Why are they trying to transform their business? And what new markets are they going after? How do they want to support their customers in new and different ways? And then we build that cloud transformation program around that. So we build out the, plat the cloud platform that allows them to consume these, these newer um, cutting edge services that are available in the Google Cloud. We, we help them migrate their on-premise data centers to the cloud. And we help them manage that entire in estate once it gets to the cloud so that they can then focus on those higher end services in, in developing new um, engagements with their customers. Uh, we 
increase this uh, cloud value by providing next generation security. So cloud native environments are very different than traditional environments and require different security techniques. We have uh, a data and analytics team, which then allows those customers, now that you have all this data in the cloud, what can you do with it? How can you use that data to improve your business, to be more responsive to your customers or react to cha those changing market conditions in, in new and different ways? On the next slide, you know, one of the things um, we're really proud of is that this year we were added to the Gartner um, cl Cloud, Public Cloud and IT Transformation Services Magic Quadrant, right? And so, you know, if anybody, I'm sure most people have heard of the Magic Quadrant from Google and um, from Gartner and, and how it's, um, you know, how it's a very thorough examination of all the different competitors in this space. And we were listed in the, the visionary quadrant of this um, because we take a different approach to cloud services. And we're not necessarily just looking to, looking at it from an IT, problem as an IT problem to solve, but really as a business opportunity for customers to adopt cloud services in new and differentiated ways um, in order to support their customers. And one of the things uh, we thought was really unique here is as in the intersection of the Gartner Magic Quadrant, um, it has this quote and, you know, in it, it says deliver on the promise of the cloud. And that has been Cloud Reach's mission statement for uh, the last five years. Um, something that we're always trying to deliver to our customers is what that promise of the cloud is and what it could be. Um, so, you know, this is a, a, a hat tip, I think, uh, from Gartner to, to CloudReach about how this is how many businesses want to operate, need to operate. And this is how, you know, CloudReach has been doing business for the last 10 years. Uh, I think if you go, is it, uh, I think uh, now I'd like to introduce our winemaker, Kevin Luther, who's from Voluptuary Wines. Uh, Kevin's gonna start us in on the first wine tasting. So I really appreciate everyone being here. And uh, after the first wine tasting, we'll get into and talk about some of those cloud trends. Thank you very much. Awesome, thank you, Rob. And uh, thank you everybody for being here and for having me here to host you for some wine tasting. I'm always uh, appreciative to be a part of this. You know, I've worked with uh, Rob and Jeff and this whole team for a few events and uh, really always like working with you guys. So thank you for having me here. So everyone, you, you should have your sparkling wine tasting kits and your food pairing packs. So the sparkling wines, um, if you have those in the fridge, you can go ahead and pull those out now um, and set them out in front of you. So you'll have had your, your package, your box showed up and you'll have these three different small sparkling wine bottles. So yes, you are correct. These are the cutest things you could possibly imagine. Uh, these little cute wine bottles. And these are single serving sparkling wines from my winery here. We are based in Sacramento, California. We are a organically grown, organically made winery and we make a range of wines from still wines to sparkling and all manner of things. So what we're gonna be tasting here today are three different sparkling wines. These are a style of sparkling wine. There's, you know, there's champagne, uh, there's Proseccos, and there's Pet Nat. The, that's a short version of the French term Petillant Natural. So it's also known as Method Ancestral. It is the most ancient way of making sparkling wines. And what's a little bit different about it is that you're gonna notice that they're a little bit cloudy. This is because of the natural method that I'll go into a little bit more in a second. But um, we have a poll question. I was going to ask you guys, how many of you know what Pet Nat or, you know, this met traditional style of sparkling is? You should see a pop up there with a poll question. Um, and doing this poll, just get a sense for how familiar people are with this style. It's a, it's a somewhat lesser known style. So as you're probably going, okay, can we open it now? I'll give you a little tip on this. With this style of sparkling, well, first of all, you notice it's a crown cap. So when you crack that crown cap, because of this style, you're going to want to at first open it a little bit gently and release the first bit of pressure and then open it the rest of the way. Um, and that'll just allow it to release that first little burst of CO2, no foam over that way or anything. And then you can pour yourself a glass of that. The other question I get is, should I drink the whole bottle of each one or part of it? Well, really it just depends on how, uh, avid of a wine drinker you are, or perhaps hard, hard of a morning you had. Uh, so um, by all means, you can, you know, drink all of it or part of it. Um, 
So this first one that we're going to crack open is the lightest one. That will be the one that on the back says Lucid Wine L9 Epiphany 2020 California Sparkling Albarino. So this wine, as you can see, has a very nice light color. This is from the Albarino grape, which is a very light grape. It tends to make more of a very crisp, fresh style, somewhat like a Sauvignon Blanc, but without maybe quite the intensity of you know, green tropical flavors that a Sauvignon Blanc has. It's a little bit more citrus, a little bit of green apple, a little bit of melon and pear on this. So uh, kind of a fun, light, crisp style sparkling. So then you guys will also likely have your food pairings in front of you. If you don't, you can go ahead and grab those. And as you're sipping on this sparkling, you can try it with any of these different snacks you have in front of you. Now, personally, I think this goes really great with the crackers and lemon curd. So you can spread a little bit of that lemon curd on your crackers and give that a try with the sparkling. It also goes really well with the classic kettle popcorn and with the gingerbread. So that's playing off of some of the flavors in this wine because that lemon curd has that citrusiness, but a little bit of almost sweetness to it as well. So it plays off the mixture of acidity and fruit flavors in the sparkling. And then the uh, gingerbread, because this does have a little bit of a gingery bite to it. You're going to notice in the finish there. So it plays off that. And then popcorn, believe it or not, is actually a very good, uh, amongst winemakers and sommeliers, a uh, really common food pairing to have around to cleanse the palate. It's fairly neutral, but has a nice saltiness and a little bit of, you know, buttery fattiness to it, which goes very well with wine. So, um, this isn't a poll question, but uh, I am curious if folks are uh, have any favorite uh, foods uh, that they're enjoying with this. But uh, you know, go ahead and snack along, and we can uh, chat about that more later as well. Um, but to wrap this wine up, I'll throw out a few more pairings here. So with my wines, I don't just talk about the wine and the wine making, but also a little bit about the pairings. So for this one, I think it has such a kind of a, a happy, bright, bubbly style to it. And it's just very fresh and kind of positive energy to me. I pair this with a very upbeat, positive uh, song by one of my favorite rappers who is from the same university where I got my winemaking degree 15 years ago, um, UC Davis. And it's Black Alicious with the song, Make You Feel That Way. And it's a song about those things like, you know, smiling at someone on the street and they smile back and, or, you know, helping an old lady cross the street or working for charity during the holidays and at a soup drive, you know, just those things that kind of make you feel good. Like life is good and the world's full of good people. So I think this is one of those bright, happy wines like that. Uh, and then my life pairing for this is a picnic in an orchard or by the water. So by a river or a lake or a river uh, or the ocean and just relaxing with some nice bubbly wine there and um, having a picnic and perhaps enjoying some of these holiday snacks. Um, so all right, as I wrap this up, I'll uh, just give a quick explanation of these pet gnats um, since we got the, uh, you know, the poll out there. And uh, to give a little more explanation for a lot of you who didn't know, uh, you know, who aren't as familiar with pet gnat. So essentially, the style of pet gnat is that when the wine is fermenting, so you've harvested the grapes through the harvest season, you've crushed them, you've pressed the juice off, and that, that juice is now fermenting into wine. It's fermenting in tank or barrel. And then right as it's about to finish fermenting, because the yeast are converting the sugars into alcohol and carbon dioxide, but most of that carbon dioxide is blowing off into the, into the air. Well, if towards the end of fermentation, you bottle that wine up while it's still fermenting naturally, that put in a crown cap right on that bottle, put in this bottle, the last of the fermentation will get trapped in there and will trap that carbon dioxide. So now you have a bubbly wine created, the bubbles are created not by forced carbonation, not from a CO2 tank like beer or something, but through the natural fermentation of the yeast that is creating the alcohol. So then you're gonna have that natural bubbliness, a little bit of cloudiness from the yeast in there. So this is actually mildly probiotic as well. Uh, so pretty much a health food you're having here today. Um, and just a nice fun style of sparkling, uh, both more ancient and traditional. And in a fun way, they're, they're just kind of lively. They're a little bit more playful than maybe a champagne, not so intense in that serious sense. They're, they're more fruit forward and fun. So hope you guys are enjoying this sparkling. Uh, Jeff and Rob, I will pass it back to you guys for the next uh, section here. And I'll see you all in a little bit for the second sparkling wine later on. Thank you.
That was uh, that was fantastic, Kevin. Thank you so much uh, for taking us through that. Um, it, yeah, I think uh, yeah we you talked about like a good uh, life pairing, which I think is always a good good way to think um, think of wine as you know as a picnic. And right now I'm in uh, New England and it's starting to get really cold, so I'm, I'm longing for the days when uh, we can take a we can take a picnic. <laughs> Uh, I, right. It made me immediately think of uh, you know migrating to the cloud, right? That's what I want to compliment my my yeah. wine drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect life period. I like it. Ex yeah. Excellent. Yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> cloud migrations are are go with really anything at this. Uh, in, <laughs> they really life. do. The bubbles will just naturally carry you up into the cloud. You know. Yeah. yeah exactly. We would, yeah, we would hope so. Yeah. Um, yeah, and let's, uh, let's talk about that a little bit, Jeff. Um, so if you want to um, jump to the next slide, you know, what we did at CloudReach uh, this year is we talked a lot about, like, what are the, some of the cloud trends that we expect to see in, um, in 2021, I'm, I'm sorry, 2022, um, as we kind of go into the next year and start to see how, uh, you know, businesses are, are starting to change the way they adopt, or maybe these just macro trends that we're starting to see in the industry that are really important. Um, and, you know, allow people to start to take on, think about the cloud in new ways. And, and so, you know, I think one of the first ones that we recognized is, you know, there's really been two eras of cloud adoption in, that we've seen. One is, has really been led by IT, where the IT teams led the cloud adoption. It was really about cost takeout, uh, closing down data centers. It was about um, infrastructure, agility, and being able to scale um, the infrastructure. Um, but what we've seen more of, and honestly think we'll see a lot more of now, is the idea of um, the businesses leading this cloud adoption. And how do the businesses um, start to uh, you know, adopt cloud services to grow their um, their practice, right, and, and work with customers in new ways. And, you know, there's a lot, I think, um, to, be, to be seen there, because now that cloud adoption is more than just how can we lower the cost of our IT spend. It's really about how can we grow the business. Um, and so, Jeff, I, you know, I wonder how do you, you know, does that resonate with you? And, you know, do you, what do you think some of those hallmarks are of that kind of business-led cloud adoption? How do, you, how do you think people should foster that kind of growth? Yeah, um, well, it's interesting to look at, right? So um, uh, one of the things we did in, in the invite to this session was ask people where they are on your cloud journey, right? What stage you are in. Um, and uh, we took an informal poll and you know we thought that most people would be the beginning of that stage, but actually, um, it's a pretty good distribution between the beginning, you know, when you're in strategy and planning versus middle when you're kind of in the thick of it and adopting cloud. Um, and then the end, which is kind of like, you know, mature cloud usage, maybe you, you are a digital native business or something like that. Um, and so, you know, I, I think for me, this started to click um, around 10 years ago, maybe a little bit earlier than that, when, you know, I, I, I grew up in the world of, of um, procurement of servers, you know, I worked with databases and if we ran out of disk space, then we needed to like, you know, go to our procurement folks and then maybe in three months we might have some more disk space, you know, um, that kind of world. And as soon as I saw the kind of, you know, flexibility that you get um, with the cloud, I knew I was hooked. Um, but more and more, you know, it is coming from the business side. I mean, we see, you know, everywhere from, you know, not just CTOs, but CEOs and boards saying, you know, what is your cloud strategy? Where, you know, um, how do you, uh, you know, how do you, how is this business, how is our business going to get the benefits of cloud? Um, you know, I would say one thing is that um, while becoming a cloud native, you know, enterprise, a cloud native business is kind of um, the goal that a lot of people have, you know, there's multiple steps to get there. And it's kind of okay to start with, you know, kind of, dipping your toe in the water, uh, doing a little bit of lift and shift, right? Bringing some workloads into just regular VMs, right? They're kind of um, commonplace these days in the cloud, um, you know, and, and trying out storage and maybe spinning up a, you know, a, a database instance of, you know, using the same technology that you use on-prem, whether that's, you know, a SQL database or something like that. 
um, you know, and, and you want to, you want to kind of experiment and, you know, it's, it's, I think a lot of times I've seen people or businesses kind of get overly focused on uh, migrating to the cloud native immediately. And they try to do both at once, try to, you know, go from, from on-prem into the cloud and then also kind of rewrite all of their applications. Um, and that, that's a tall order, right? So um, it might be practical to kind of stage it and, and take it in, in, uh, in steps. Yeah, and you mentioned a couple of times, right? The idea of experimentation, right? And how, yeah how uh, you know, people should try and experiment with the cloud. And, that, and honestly, I think that's, that's really about what a big part of being a cloud native enterprise is, is the ability to experiment and try out a thousand things um, to see what works, what doesn't work. And you know, where I see businesses getting stuck is if they try and plan out every single step of this, this very long journey um, you know, in advance, and then you know, try and execute on that, that that plan um, without any kind of uh, ability to, to experiment or try new things. Um, and that's where I, you know, I think people miss the mark a bit because they're not, if you're not open to that kind of change thing, you're, you're not gonna you know, realize a lot of the value that cloud can offer. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, and, and I think um, you know, one of the things that, you know, when I talk to, to customers, right, one of the things, um, a lot of times they talk about, well, you know, I, I want to make sure this change is not disruptive. I don't want to make sure we can keep business as usual. But, you know, I think this is one of those areas and you should actually anticipate some disruption. You should anticipate the way in which you're doing things is going to change. Um, and that can be good, right? Because, uh, you know, cloud is fundamentally different. There are fun new services and new capabilities that will be, uh, will be, available to your business that you just don't have now. And so being able to try those things out and, you know, try them out, if it fails, you know, there's very low cost to that failure at cloud. Yeah. Um, I we have a question here, actually. Oh, great. Yeah. So I, I think the question is, do you recommend trying to go fully cloud native and migrating to the cloud at the same time? Or would you modernize um, as you migrate or after you migrate? So I think that's what we were just kind of talking about a little bit. And um, I, I, I think for me, I would recommend, um, you know, experimenting again, we're using that word, but experimenting with the modernization part, maybe in one app or one part of your, you know, kind of overall footprint, maybe it's a team, um, you know, and we'll get into the kind of cultural aspects of this, but, you know, as long as you have the right um, uh, kind of overall view on, you know, on security, on governance and, and kind of the management layer, um, you know, I, I think you can you can bring a team and say, hey, there's this new thing that you want to do. Um, you know, it can be very kind of fun and exciting for that team to be able to use the kind of cloud native approach while you have kind of the larger footprint, you know, perhaps going through a more sort of traditional, you know, lift and shift, right? So you can think about it in different ways across your estate. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. And I think that brings us to the, the next point that and uh, the next trend that we have here. Um, so if you flip the slide to the, the next one, really it's, it's talking about like, what are some of those patterns going to be in the future? And how are some of these cloud technologies going to be applied um, to these migration and modernization practices? I mean, historically migration to the cloud and has, has been difficult, right? There's a lot of work, there's a lot of steps, there's a lot of, I think experience that kind of gets um, embedded into the process. So you need somebody who has done this process before. Um, in modernization, I think even more so, right? But how, you know, we think over the next couple of years, you know, there's going to be a, a change in the way in that migrations and modernization is, is really um, tackled in new tools and techniques coming out that will allow us to, you know, collect data in more um, automated ways and, and start to make some of the decisions right now that are made by, you know, uh, very experienced architect, cloud architects, right? But being able to take their knowledge and codify that um, to, to create these automations. And so, you know, I, you know, I think, you know, Jeff, I, you know, I'm curious, like, are you starting at Google, right, to start to think about, like, how do you, you optimize some of these processes, helping customers get to the cloud, 
um, you know, in, in helping them with some of the more difficult use cases that they have in getting to the cloud. Yeah, I mean, one thing that occurs to me here is, um, you know, we talk about AI and machine learning um, and, you know, Google, of course, has had um, a bunch of, you know, experience bringing AI and machine learning into, you know, all of the products, including cloud, right? So, for example, there's recommendations in the GCP um, your Google Cloud Platform that basically will learn from what you're uh, what, what you're, uh, what you've deployed there and make recommendations about, Hey, you know, maybe you could lower your, your cloud bill by, by migrating to a different, you know, VM type, right. Using less memory or less, uh, less storage, for example. And, um, you know, that's, that's just learning from data. We're just setting up an, an optimization routine that, you know, is trying to, you know, optimize cost, Right. And, um, you know, that, that can be very powerful. I think your point of, you know, you have these sort of artisanal craftspeople, you know, not unlike winemakers, right? Hopefully there's some AI in, in wine these days as well. But, you know, there's craftspeople associated with saying, you know, this is the exact right picture and, and layout of a cloud architecture. Well, you know, there's value to that. There's creativity. Um, but there's also a fair amount of learning from data. And if you want to optimize for the best outcomes, you know, you can do that with, with machine learning algorithms. And I think that's what your some of your migration tools uh, that you have in CloudReach do, right? I mean, it, they're, they're effective yeah. at looking at other, across the swath of migrations that have happened in the past and saying, how do we, you know, come up with an algorithm, you know, so-called to, to kind of get you there in the best way. Yeah, and that's it. You're right. We have, um, so at CloudReach, we have two sets of tools that we use for this kind of thing. And, and they both use data, um, both from our, our customers' environments, right? Um, one is called Cloudomize, which collects um, hundreds of data points about a customer's infra infrastructure and then starts to track those data points over time so that we can make um, very detailed uh, recommendations for what type of environment um, in instances they should be using in the cloud. And so this allows us to get very prescriptive with our recommendations for customers based on, you know, historical information in you know historical records of, of hundreds of thousands of machines and how they've run in the cloud and how those machines um, you know the current infrastructure that it's running on prem how does that map to the infrastructure that's in the cloud and and so we're able to not only give the customer the right sizing information but really able to right size it um, so that you know they're not starting out in the cloud with an instance size that's either too big or too small for the particular workload in the, um, the resource requirements that it has. Um, so we do that to help customers understand what their new cloud environment will look like. Uh, we use Cloudomize for that. We have a new product um, that we're just launching and it's in, uh, still in beta, but um, it's a it's very uh, interesting product because it looks at an existing cloud environment and then makes recommendations for modernization, right? So we'll look at an environment and say, yes, based on what we see here, you might be able to use a, um, a database platform in the cloud versus a you know, Microsoft SQL um, server that, that you're paying a license for. Or you know, we might look at it and say, you know what? Looking at this application, understanding how it runs, we think that this is a candidate for containerization. And so we're able to then make these recommendations to customers, again, using you know, 10, 12 years of historic information that you know, in, in our engineers' you know, best recommendations and, and best practices, um, you know, using that, the data that we're able to collect to make these recommendations so that customers can get to the, you know, understand you know, what changes they should make in the cloud and, and which ones will have the biggest business impact. Um, so I what I think we'll do now is maybe go back to Kevin. Um, you know, we'll uh, get onto our second uh, sparkling wine and uh, hear more about um, some of the, the things that he's doing at his vineyard. Awesome, thank you Rob and Jeff again. Um, so our second wine we're gonna be tasting here is the 
We'll say on the back there, the L1 Skin Contact. And this is a 2020 vintage sparkling Chardonnay blend. So this is based primarily on the Chardonnay grape, but with a little bit of Viognier as well. So the Chardonnay is going to give you some peach pear apple flavors on this sparkler. And then you're going to get a little bit of the Viognier influence, which is more tropical fruit floral notes. So this all comes together to give a lot of like orchard fruits, you know, uh, and then in my notes here, I also have some tropical stuff going on, you know, you, some of the guava, passion fruit, almost a, a mango characteristic going on. So it's very, very fruit forward and almost sweet on the smell, but you're going to notice in the finish, it's almost this like bubbly sour fruitiness. So you have this really nice mix of just ripe fruit and a crisp sourness to the finish there. So this one's a little less bubbly than the first one, but um, you know, the one of the other things about Petalon Natural is because, or you know, Pet Nat, which is just so a lot very fun to say, um, about the Pet Nat sparkling style is it's not so aggressively sparkling as some champagnes and cavas. You know, certain champagnes and cavas, it's just like overwhelmingly bubbly, right? These are just a little more subtle in their bubbles. And this style, you're going to notice, well, let's say golden or orange colored sparkling. So this comes from the fact that these are white grapes, but whereas white wines and white sparklings are made by fermenting just the juice of a white grape, because the juice is clear and so you get a more or less clear, lightly tinted wine. Well, if you use those same white grapes, but you ferment the wine in the skins for a little while, those white grape skins are actually a little bit more of a golden or orange color. So you're actually going to extract some of that golden orange color into the wine, which is what you're seeing here. This is why this has a little bit of a golden orange color to it. So this wine pairs very well with a couple of our other food pairings here. This will go with that lemon curd as well, but it also goes really well with your apricot jam. Um, this will also go pretty well with your gingerbread, but I would say give that dark chocolate sea salt, salt caramel a try because this has a little bit of that like almost somewhere between really ripe fruit and caramely notes on it as well. Um, some of that caramel aspect in the wine comes from the fact that this was aged briefly in some oak barrels. So it gives a little bit of a caramel vanilla flavor that goes with that. Um, and then you can even play around with a little bit of those cranberries, which I think now you're starting to get into a little bit, uh, you know, well, the red fruit that is going to go a little better with our rosé. But I think those cranberries go well with this one as well, uh, playing off some of the fruitiness in this. So you can try those pairings, sample around and see what you like best. And then on this sparkling wine, I have another poll question for you all. This one's a bit of a trivia question. So which do you think has a higher pressure? So like PSI, atmospheres, you know, whatever uh, standards of measure you use. Um, what has the most pressure? A car tire? a bottle of champagne, or hard seltzer. So this is a, um, we, we do wine trivia sometimes, and this is one of our wine trivia questions. So, all right. Um, Cool. So as you guys are answering that, I'll go on to, uh, as promised, give you guys just a little more information about us as a winery. So I mentioned we are based here in Sacramento, California. We are a fully organic winery. So all of our grapes are organically grown, organically made. And we uh, work with vineyards that we farm and work with partner farms all around Northern California and the surrounding regions, Sierra, Sierra Foothills and Lodi, and then we make all of the wine here at our facility in Sacramento, California. And all of our winemaking processes are organic and natural and a little bit more innovative and forward thinking than the average winery. And I think that's one of the reasons we, you know, you see us in these virtual tastings and aligning with such forward thinking companies is, you know, birds of a feather flock together. I, um, I, I'm a big fan of innovative winemaking and innovative business thinking. And in fact, we are a, uh, you know, virtual native company ourselves. The funny thing is I've been making wine for 15 years uh, all over the world, including running wineries and building up wineries before I launched my own. But when I launched my own winery, for better or worse, I launched right in the middle. Well, my launch party was scheduled for March 28th, 2020. Let me put it that way. Um, so I was never able to physically launch 
for my first year and a half of existence, we launched virtually. So for most of our existence, we have been a 100% virtual winery um, that only does tastings in a virtual environment like we're doing right here, right now. And so the importance of you know, your, your, your cloud of your virtual environment and having those systems running effectively is something that's very close to my heart. So, um, yeah, with that, that kind of wraps up this wine. And by the way, the answer to the trivia question is, um, that a bottle of champagne has the highest pressure of all those things. You know, uh, the, um, bottle of champagne is usually about five or six atmospheres. Um, Whereas a car tire is only two or three, and a bottle of seltzer is about two or three as well, depending on the brand. So, uh, yeah, and most of you guys got that right. That is a good job reading the teacher or just knowing your uh, knowing your pressures. <laughs> so, with that, uh, Rob and Jeff, I'll hand it back to you all. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, that's fascinating, and you know, I'm super excited that you've been able to uh, grow your business even through these kind of difficult tech. Uh, times where you know you, you normal business doesn't really apply right and i think you know for a lot of people they've had the same experience and every business has been impacted by you know the pandemic and i think you know as people started to you know realize that you know this was really going to be a a transformational kind of event for for the entire uh, world right they they started to realize you know, that the agility of the cloud is really what can help them get through this, um, these times, right? And the ability to pivot either their, their business model or their customer engagement models. And, you know, we, we found, and there's been a lot of research that has shown that the businesses that had more investments, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, did better throughout the pandemic um, as a business because they were able to, to pivot and transition in ways that, you know, a traditional business was not able to do. And, and we found, you know, that a lot of businesses have really increased their transformation um, programs over the last year and a half um, because they've recognized that, you know, the, a pandemic like the one we're in now, the COVID, um, it's kind of once in a hundred years kind of event, but, you know, there's all these other regional events, whether weather related, um, you know, political unrest, there's all kinds of events that happen all over the world um, that can really affect business. And, you know, the idea that you can quickly change, pivot, you know, these are the things that, you know, allow your business to be more successful. Um, and, you know, I think this is, this is really a kind of one of the topics that we have in our next section here. Um, with Jeff and I, and so you know, it's really about how do you how do you grow this cultural mindset? How do you kind of you know at, attract the right people, and also you know how do you grow their um, understanding of the cloud so that they can understand the possibility of the cloud? Um, and so on the next slide, it's really about you know the idea of this talent crisis um, for cloud services, and it is you know it is a very real thing, um, one that we find here at uh, CloudReach, it's very, very difficult to attract and retain, you know, top-notch cloud talent. And so these are the problems, um, you know, that we are, we're facing here. Um, and, you know, I think it's, it's always been hard to find good IT skills uh, and good IT employees. Um, but, you know, I think it's even harder now as more businesses are starting to transform into the cloud. Um, and so, you know, we've, we at CloudReach have, have started to think about this problem um, and trying to solve it in, in different ways and not necessarily, you know, just going after and, and uh, buying the talent, right? And, and paying more, but really about how do we expand what that talent pool is, right? And, and so one way is we're looking into um, how do we how do we expand that and you know look at a more diverse talent pool um, you know to try and enable them to be you know have some of these cloud skills uh, and so you know I think I guess Jeff the question I would have to you is you know it, do you see this as a short term issue do you see this as a uh, you know kind of an issue that's here to stay and and how are you seeing you know other businesses trying to tackle um, and, and retain the right kind of talent. Yeah. Um, well, I think there's probably short-term aspects to it insofar as the pandemic um, had a lot of disruption in the talent market. 
Um, you know, people uh, put off getting a new job because they were uncertain. And then when things, you know, kind of com started coming back, um, there was a lot of, you know, uh, kind of optimism. And, you know, we saw, um, you know, we saw that just like any other business, right? Um, I, I really liked, uh, you know, your also your point generally on, you know, this, this, the, the idea of, you know, thinking about talent as a, you know, a diversity um, and, you know, inclusion kind of problem, right? So, you know, some of the things that, that Google has done is, you know, emphasize expanding in markets where, you know, we haven't, you know, outside of the Bay Area, right? Outside of the, the traditional kind of Silicon Valley um, sort of core of the company, um, you know, and, and that makes a ton of difference. I also think looking at, you know, this concept of, um, you know, uh, culture ad rather than culture fit, that's something that's been coming up quite a lot. So, you know, uh, in, especially in the kind of the engineering um, recruiting process, there's sort of, there has been this, had been this idea of, you know, recruiting for, you know, people who, you know, fit the culture of the organization. And there's an appeal to that, but, you know, the reality is that you wind up with a lot of people who are similar to each other, right? And if you think instead about culture ad, where can we find people with different types of backgrounds and different experiences, maybe, you know, different types of education, for example, um, rather than just looking for computer science degrees, you know, let's look for people who have gone through boot camps or have gotten, you know, career certificates um, or even just their, their, um, their business folks, right? Their accountants, their marketers, right? Um, you know, the, the, the skills that are needed to be successful in technology these days um, are, are broadening all the time, right? Where, you know, digital is all around us all the time, you know, and, and, and even, you know, you can code in a spreadsheet, right? So, um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that there's, uh, there will be a point, in fact, with cloud in particular, where, um, you know, hiring for cloud engineering or hiring for cloud technology will just mean the same thing as hiring for technology, right? Because it'll sort of all be I'll be, uh, you know, running in the cloud, and um, you know, maybe the folks who own, who don't know cloud will start to look more and more like the, you know, the COBOL mainframe programmers who are kind of, you know, they're still out there. Um, <laughs> it's hard to hire them, and but if you have a mainframe, you know, God bless you. Um, but you know, it's it's not the majority of, of kind of where the talent is going. Yeah, no, that's a great. Uh, I like the idea of you know, that how you express a culture ad versus you know. Yeah you know, culture fit, right? And, and at CloudReach, one of the things that we did uh, to help with this, right, is we, we started what we call the Talent Academy and where we purposely expanded where we looked for talent. And we didn't look for skills, right? We didn't look for people that had traditional cloud skills, like, you know, you had to have a, you know, a certification in this or, or a college degree in that. Right, but what we went out and looked for is really the people who had the right attitude, um, and we did, you know, a lot of kind of testing for that in the interview process. For like, do we think they have the right attitude, the right uh, soft skills to be successful in our business and with our customers? Right, things like creativity and things about problem solving and um, you know collaboration and you know really testing for those types of things. Uh, and then we've built a talent um, uh, academy to teach them some of these, these cloud skills. So those actually are the things that are, are, are more teachable, right? And so, you know, we're able to then build out what that curriculum should be over the next couple of months. And we're going to take those, that cohort of students through that process. Um, and so, you know, what happened though, is because when we took off all those IT skill requirements, it just expanded the talent pool exponentially. And it allowed us to look in places with people with different backgrounds. We have people who were mid-career, and like you said, we're in a business career and wanted to, you know, to become more um, IT-centric. We had people who were, uh, you know, one person was just starting his uh, PhD in mathematics and decided he wanted to, you know, get into cloud services. And so, you know, these are people that, normally would never even think of applying and, and we would never even, you know, ex, you know, look at them for an interview. And so this allows you, you know, this is, I think, what we need to do as an industry is start to think about not necessarily, you know, here's the skills, you have to have this background, you have to have, you know, this degree from this university, 
you know, but really about how do we broaden that scope? And what, you know, we find is that, you know, this diversity of thought that people from many different backgrounds, different skills, different ethnicities really provides a, a much richer experience for our customers. And, and, you know, if you get, you think about two pizza teams or, you know, these different, you know, groups of people working together, you know, if they're all the same, you're kind of going to get the same, you know, answers, or you're going to provide the customer with the same, you know, amount of the, the same information. But if you have a very diverse team, right, that, that's when you start to really start to get interesting um, and unique perspectives that come in and, and can help, um, you know, with, with these unique and interesting problems that our customers have. Yeah. Um, for sure. I just, so, so sorry to interrupt, Rob, but I see that there's a question in the chat from Jim. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if we want to want to tackle that next. And I think it does actually connect to this talent in a, in an interesting way. His question is about, you know, given uh, the AWS outage yesterday, um, can we can we talk about Google's uptime guarantees or remediation for outages? And um, you know, so I'm happy to address that if you want to jump into it. I know it's a little bit outside of talent, but there, you know, I could probably connect it there. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is a good, uh, yeah. Let's, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a great question. So, you know, um, where I was going to go with it is, uh, so Google has a, as an approach and, and kind of invented or maybe popularized an approach called Site Reliability Engineering, or SRE. Um, and actually, one of my coworkers in the Octo team, Office of the CTO, uh, spent many years in Google's SRE teams and, and kind of has a, you know, a, a unique perspective on this because of that. Um, you know, and... Uh, there's a lot of kind of engineering around reliability that um, that we've thought about, you know, uh, because of that, you know, because we've operated at scale, because Google's operated at scale for many, many years, you know, the notion of, you know, 100% non-failure is, is just not practical. In fact, there's a, um, uh, you know, it, it, there's sort of an option, there's a, a concept of, you know, um, uh, like uh, f sort of failure budgets that you might have, right? Where you, um, you're allowing a certain amount of unreliability in exchange for, in for being able to move more quickly and have innovation, right? And you need to monitor, monitor that budget, um, but you have, and you have obligations towards that. So you need to have a lot of kind of instrumentation around it. Um, that being said, you know, a, a, a large scale outage is, um, you know, is cer certainly not fun. Um, you know, there have been a handful of these across the different cloud vendors and cl cloud providers for, you know, across the years. And it's, um, it's really a chance to um, get into a postmortem and really understand what happened and then really, you know, engineer methods to minimize the likelihood of that sort of thing happening in the future, right? Um, so, you know, remediation in terms of, um, you know, how customers can, can handle that and, and how, how Google handled it. Often there's, you know, built in reliability um, features into cloud, right? So being able to move a workload from one region to another, or one zone to another sometimes, um, you know, even actually embracing a multi-cloud um, or a hybrid uh, footprint sometimes makes sense for business critical, you know, applications um, or high scale applications. And then frankly, there are some workloads where it's just, it still kind of doesn't make sense to you know, move that move that workload into the cloud still, right? So I, I would cite an example of you know, kind of lo super low latency uh, market exchanges, right? Exchange uh, traffic. Um, we just announced an agreement with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange uh, to explore that over a ten-year period, right? How can we actually have trading operations in you know in a public cloud infrastructure? So I'll pause there, but that's a really yeah. good question, and you know, wanted to kind of dig in a little bit. Uh, no, I think that's good. And if you go to the next slide, I think it connects a little bit to there as well as, is, uh, you know, the idea of developing DQ like IQ, right? But, you know, thinking, thinking digitally, right? And developing that digital mindset. And so, you know, I think when people, uh, you know, just quickly on this point, but I, I think as people start to think about cloud native design, you know, they can begin to start to think about the, the things that you just talked about, Jeff, is, is how can they, um, you know, think about their applications differently and not necessarily about these, these monolithic applications that can, that can never go down, right? Because they have so much 
connection and, and responsibility to their entire business. But once you begin to break these things up, you can then start to have different SLAs for different parts of that, you know, those services that you're delivering. And then this allows you to, I think, be more prescriptive and more uh, reasonable with how you're, you're, you're designing your architecture. Um, and so this, I think, is, uh, you know, how as people start to think about, you know, digitally, how do they how do they start to operate their business in these cloud native ways, right? And start to think about their applications and workloads in these, these kind of cloud native ways. I um, mean, you know, and this I think is critical for companies, you know, to really be able to uh, be successful and, and take advantage of cloud. Um, it's not only do you have to attract the right talent, but you know, the, the people that are within your organization, especially the leadership of your organization needs to start to understand what the promise of the cloud is, right? And if you have a, a CEO or a CTO that only thinks of the cloud as uh, infrastructure and, and you know, a data center that, you know, is, uh, they don't have to pay the bill for the building, you know, it, as that kind of opportunity, you're not gonna get the most benefit from the cloud. And so, you know, I think in the future, the CTO or the CIO of an organization is really gonna start to be one of the, the, the most important person in that, in that boardroom because they're the ones that are going to be enabling all this um, new, all these new services and deliver, delivery um, uh, models for their customers. And so, you know, I think, you know, one of the, the challenges is, is really how do, you, how do you foster that within business? How do you, um, you know, get your organizations to start to understand that and begin to think differently and not, you know, IT as, a, as an enabler of the business? Um, you know, just, so, you know, just Jeff, if you have any, uh, any other thoughts on that and how the, you know, businesses can start to develop this, this digital mindset. Yeah, well, I know we want to get to our last wine, so I'll be brief. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I like a, a phrase I use sometimes is uh, it's not just renting servers, right? If you just wanted to rent servers, like you could do that in a colo or something like that, right? Um, so I agree with what you're saying that there's this sort of digital thinking, this digital mindset that you, you know, ideally, um, uh, you know, if you can unlock that, it lets you, you know, really grow the top line as well as kind of concentrating on the costs, right? Um, of the middle line, right? So, um, you know, an example that I might cite with a customer that, you know, that I've worked with pretty closely is Equifax, right? Um, and they've gone through, uh, you know, an amazing transformation in the, you know, few years since um, they had a, a pretty well popularized uh, breach in their infrastructure. They decided to really, you know, embrace digitization and, and the digital mindset of moving into the cloud. They brought in a new leader. There was, you know, a board level agreement um, uh, you know, to modernize into the cloud. And now a few years later, you know, they're really starting to accelerate um, in, and do, you know, some really, really interesting things. So um, it, it, is, uh, it is important to, um, you know, think about, um, think about this as, as a business, you know, um, as, as, from the business leader's point of view, not just as a cost center. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, with that, yeah, I do want to get to uh, the last wine tasting because I know uh, everyone's thirsty here, and, uh, but great conversation. Um, so, uh, Kevin, if you want to kind of take us through our last wine, that'd be great. Awesome. Thank you, Rob. So, our third and final sparkling is the L2 Urban Flora Rosé Sparkling. So, <clears throat> this is a rosé, which is... So whether as a sparkling or as a still wine, rosés are essentially lighter wines made from red grapes. So I was talking earlier about that skin contact on the last wine with a white grape. In this case, there's a, only a little bit of skin contact. So, that bit, so when you get a red grape, the inside is clear. The skins have all the color. So to make a red wine, you might ferment on the skins for one week or four weeks. When you make a rosé, you only leave the grapes and the skins for a couple of hours or a couple of days. So you get a lighter color like this, sort of a dark pink, light red. You're gonna get fruit flavors that match that color. So watermelon, strawberry, cherry, um, and just that gentle sort of light red, pink fruit flavors. So you get a lot, of, again, a lot of fruit. These are very fruit forward, fun style sparklings. And 
in addition to all that fruit, you're going to again get a little bit of a sourness here, which is why I say cherry and cranberry. Um, this is going to pair very well with those dried cherries, those dried cranberries, and you're going to have some berry preserves as well. Those are all going to be very nice pairings with this. You can also try that dark chocolate raspberry and see how that goes too. So some really good options here on this one on the food pairings. And um, this is a rosé from a couple of different grapes, but primarily the Mission grape, which is a really fun, unique grape. This particular vine uh, or vineyard that grows these grapes is about 100 years old. It's a really ancient vineyard uh, that these vines are huge and old and produce just this very delicious grape growing organically down by the McCallum River here uh, in Lodi, California. So fun wine, very fruit forward. And as we're wrapping this one up, I'll throw out um, the pairings here. The music pairing is the song Summer Vibe by Walk Off the Earth. And although we're in winter here, um, you know, you got a, a bottle of sunshine here, a little uh, taste of summertime amidst the winter. And the life pairing is sunset drinks with friends, hanging out, watching that beautiful, you know, sunset and watching uh, all the colors create over the skyline and enjoying this wine. And lastly, I'll wrap up by saying, you know, uh, you guys were talking about talent and the kind of the, the talent market right now. And I'll share my, my experience with that briefly, uh, you know, going into being a virtual winery, a digital winery, essentially, you know, I needed sommeliers. I needed people who knew how to serve wine, but the traditional sommelier was someone who wasn't really comfortable with virtual tastings that, you know, the digital world wasn't native to them. So although I actually tried to bring in some sommeliers, they didn't actually do very well. They, they, they struggled in a digital environment and the people I ended up holding on to and promoting were largely much younger people. So two of my sommeliers are, are in their early 20s. And so they grew up digitally native. They were very comfortable in a digital environment. And while they weren't wine people originally, they were actually, both of them are professional circus performers, believe it or not, um, that they've both been performing professionally in the circus since they were like 15 or 14. And so their performance abilities translated, their digital nativeness translated, and then I paid for their education to get sommelier training. So now there's sommeliers as well. So it definitely, I, I had to take, you know, what you were saying there really spoke to me because it's like, yeah, I, I definitely had to do that. Like find people who fit my company culture, were naturals, but maybe hadn't been cultivated yet, and then teach them and lead them into this and, and develop that talent. Um, so yeah, that wraps up this wine. And uh, thank you guys so much for uh, letting me host you through the wines. I'll be handing it back to Rob and Jeff here, but I wanted to also just say thank you for everything. And I'll, I'll post a link here if you guys, anyone really liked the wines and wanted to order some, I'll get you some discounts as well. So thank you all so much. And uh, Rob and Jeff, back to you. Kevin, yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that's really great information uh, about all those wines. I mean, I, I, I definitely learned a lot and how, um, you know, the wines are made in, in really, uh, I, I think it's interesting. And, and like you said, I mean, that, you know, finding the right talent is so important to a business. Um, and, and so, you know, one of the things, and, and this is something that, uh, that Kevin mentioned earlier about how they're uh, yeah organic winery, right. And, and all their grapes are grown organically. So they obviously see the importance of um, sustainability, right? And, and I think the same holds true for every business, right? Like all of us have a responsibility to do the best we can um, to reduce the amount of carbon um, that we we use in um, in the cloud is a is actually a really good way to do that. Uh, and so, you know, I know, uh, you know, Jeff can talk a lot about, you know, the, the things that Google has done um, to make sure their cloud is, uh, is, is it minimizes the amount of um, carbon output. And, you know, I think there's also ways in which we can, you know, not only by picking the right cloud provider, but also the way in which we run our IT that can help. Um, but maybe Jeff, you can give us a little bit of information about what Google is doing in the cloud and, and how they're minimizing the amount of carbon emissions. Yeah, happy to. And um, if, if you want, this will be just a little <clears throat> sort of brief intro on this, but if you want to go deeper, um, I was uh, fortunate enough to be a guest on the Cloud Reach uh, podcast 
where we were talking recently about sustainability and in, in, in cloud and in technology. And so if you want to check that out, I think it's called cloud busting. Um, and so, uh, you know, you, you can, you can check that out afterwards, but you know, the, the, the sort of the short story is that Google has been, um, thinking about sustainability basically since inception. Um, we were the first major company to go uh, carbon neutral in um, 2007. And then in 2017, that was the first year where we started matching our annual consumption of electricity um, and energy with uh, new renewable purchases, right? So we called this kind of renewable energy matching. Um, and we started doing that on a global and annual basis, right? So the amount of, of carbon emissions or, or greenhouse gas emissions that we had, we would offset that with uh, new additional wind or solar or other types of renewable energy projects that we, that we commit to and, and build from scratch um, uh, through power purchase agreements primarily. Um, so these are, you know, sort of uh, newer models of doing this, but really that's not good enough. What's, what we really need to do is, is not emit the carbon in the first place. And so we've established a 24 by seven carbon free energy goal uh, by 2030 to run all of Google, Google's data centers and operations on carbon free energy around the clock, right? So think about you know, powering the, an entire data center worth of computers and networking equipment and storage completely on wind, solar, geothermal, clean hydrogen, uh, batteries, you, know, you name it, right? We're looking at different types of technologies to apply here. Uh, and doing that in all of the grids where we operate around the world. Um, so it's an ambitious target, it's a moonshot. And what's great is that since we're doing this for Google, we're doing this also for Google Cloud. And all of Google Cloud's customers you know, can see the benefit of that directly. And in fact, there's already um, several data centers and regions that Google has that are above 90% carbon-free energy. And we give you tools in the dashboard to be able to deploy your workloads into those regions. Right, and that will directly lower your own business's emissions. Right, if you if you look at um, kind of the amount of carbon that's being emitted by your you know or IT workloads or by your products, um, that you have a direct impact, and it's like kind of in your hands as you know as a technology team today. Um, so there's uh, you know, and that's just scratching the surface. There's all kinds of ways to think about decarbonization uh, through your products, through your services, um, you know, working with your customers. Uh, and your users. And so this is an area that I'm super passionate about. And, and uh, um, you know, I love the idea of, you know, thinking about it from an agricultural perspective as well, Kevin, you know, there, there's, there's all sorts of opportunities for doing, you know, sustainable agriculture, um, which I'm sure you're, you know, into. And, you know, we, we've seen businesses, you know, running robots through the, through the fields to, you know, take pictures of plant, individual plants and try to identify, you know, what they need, right, in terms of water or, um, you know, organic treatments, right? So there's a ton of, of really interesting applications of technology that can be applied here. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, uh, yeah, I mean, maybe uh, <laughs> Jeff and I, uh, we can start a little pilot project to, uh, yeah. you know, Go help uh, wineries uh, and, and then sample the, the products after. All we need is some circus performers, some robots. <laughs> yeah, know. we got <laughs> we're good. Right, your your normal winery visit. So <laughs> circus yeah. performers, robots, and some bottles of bubbly. Yeah, go, that, sounds, that sounds like a good time. Uh, yeah, and you know one of the other things, um, you know, I uh, I did just this week actually is um, Google and Intel uh, created this online curriculum um, to to you know, help people understand how they can change their business and what changes they can make. So not only using Google as a cloud service, but how do you change your infrastructure um, to make it run more efficiently, right? And maybe it's using new technologies like platform services or serverless, or even right. just changing the way your, your algorithms run so that they maybe run a little more efficiently. Um, you know, and so the, that Google and Intel uh, program was really fascinating for me. And, you know, I, I think it's something that anybody uh, can just sign up for. And it's, it's, it's pretty easy, but very informative um, kind of content that, that I recommend to everybody. Um, and, you know, I think uh, we've, we've gone over our time. Hopefully uh, people are still with us and find the content interesting. I think um, on the next slide, you know, we, I just have a little bit of information on uh yeah the the podcast that uh jeff was on um it's actually run uh by 
two people at CloudReach, Dave Chapman, who's head of strategy, and uh, Jez, who's an enterprise cloud strategist, who's been a CTO at a lot of major enterprises around the world. Um, so they offer every week um, some fascinating insight and lots of really interesting guests like Jeff, who go deep dive into different topics around, um, around, the, around uh, cloud services. Um, and so, you know, one of the things, uh, I'll open it up now um, to maybe questions. I think that might be the next slide. Um, but before I do, I was hoping everybody, you know, could turn on their cameras because um, we'd love to take a picture of everybody um, in toasting to uh, the holiday season with one of these great wines that we have. Um, so if you don't mind putting on your cameras, um, raising a glass with us and uh, hopefully uh, we'll get some. Uh, and so, I, you know, I think there's, we got 26 participants still on the, uh, on the chat. Hopefully we can get a few of them to come on and we'll do a screenshot. Um, we'd love to do a screenshot just to capture the moment. Maybe we could stop the presentation. I don't know if that. Yeah, can we take off the presentation? Yeah. And then we'll go into a quick Q&A. Uh, so I guess yeah, just let's get more of you on camera and then we'll take the shot. Looks like people are popping their cameras off. Don't be shy. Yeah. Don't be shy. We'll, uh, <laughs> and if you need to, if you need to, you can take a couple more sips before you turn your camera on. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but we definitely appreciate everyone joining us today, hanging on and uh, spending a little bit of time with us. So if everybody could uh, raise your glass um, and, you know, let's cheers to uh, successful cloud migrations and modernizations in the new year for all of us and uh, several more bottles of uh, sparkling wine. <laughs> cheers. Cheers. Cheers to everybody. Thank you very much for attending. Uh, I do, uh, I can, uh, Jeff and I can uh, hang around and do any kind of questions and answers. If anybody has a, a question that they'd like to ask, happy to uh, you know, take it on on any topic you know, that we covered today or anything else that's in, that you might uh, have to ask. Uh, let's see, Nazi, did we get any other questions in the chat? Yes, we did. Let me pop those in. And while I'm um, sending this over, if we can, Brandon, put on the um, slide that shares how the participants can, can get in touch with us, if they have any questions. There we go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Awesome. All right, well, I'll just read them to you. <laughs> so um, someone asked, about sustainability and decarbonization, I think, is it about finding the right regions with the power sources? And then how do you make your IT run more efficiently? Yeah, um, so on the first question, um, it definitely varies by region, right? Different, different regions, different data centers have different access to uh, carbon-free energy. Um, so for example, um, uh, the Google Cloud Oregon data center has a lot of access to renewable um, uh, water, hydropower. The Iowa data center has uh, lots of access to uh, wind power. Um, and so, you know, you're sort of getting that choice for free when you choose to deploy a workload in a particular data center, right? Um, so that's kind of the, one of the simplest ways to, to sort of start. Um, you know, and then on the efficiency side, essentially you're getting the benefits of Google's continuous search for greater efficiency over time, right? Um, I think the amount of computing that we've uh, been able to apply in our data centers has drastically in increased while our energy consumption has, has only risen marginally over the past like seven to 10 years. So, um, you know, we're, we're kind of continuously bringing new efficiency models into play that way. Yeah, and if you think of your environments and um, how they're constructed in, in how they operate, right? If, think about all the overhead you need to run uh, an operating system, for example, right? And so if there's ways in which you can reduce the number of operating systems you're running, 
right? And maybe move to a, a platform service like containers or serverless. Uh, you know, those can help uh, make your make your overall IT infrastructure run more efficiently and use less energy. Uh, another way in which I, I just heard about this the other day, which is kind of amazing to me, is you know one of the most popular uh, zip utilities to like zip up lots of files. Um, Gzip is is one of the most inefficient um, ways of doing it, and so there's lots of alternatives to that. You know that can run twenty percent more efficient. Um, and can save a lot of energy, right? And if you think about that, like a lot of, you know, processes may zip up files and store them, right? And that mm. can happen millions of times, um, you know, for a business, it, it, depending on how it's utilized. And so, you know, finding little ways like that, you know, that can be compounded over, you know, millions of transactions or executions could, you know, significantly reduce your overall uh, power consumption as well. That's super interesting. I hadn't heard of that one yet. Yeah, no, I mean, there's plenty of alternatives that I think run right. just as well, but you know, are more efficient in the way in which they do that uh, compression algorithm. Yep. Um, and so another question that just came in on the chat, which I think is is kind of interesting, and I'll, I'll give uh, it's difficult, so I'll give it to Jeff. Is uh, you know can, how do you measure that uh, DQ right? Like something that we talked a little bit about earlier is you know how does an organization you know you can measure IQ, but how do you measure DQ? Yeah, um, they, this is a tougher one, right? Because it's not like a, a, a you know um, it, it may be sort of secondary or maybe uh, indirect. Uh, indirectly shows up in your kind of business metrics, like your revenue or your costs. Um, frankly, we do a lot of surveying. Uh, we survey internally in Google quite a lot. You know, we use Google Forms very informally. Um, we send to, you know, even inside different teams. Um, we survey our customers that we work with really closely on the Octo team. Um, and so you get a, you, you know, if you ask sort of the right questions, um, whether that's like an NPS, NPS score or something like that, you start to get an understanding of, of how um, of how this sort of digital mindset is being um, is being thought about, uh, you know, uh, by your audience, by your users, right? And those are the folks who really uh, who matter in that in that equation. Um, I would say also just just measuring experiment velocity, right, or release frequency, um, or things like that. Those are kind of interesting metrics that you can apply. You know, once you instrument your processes and, and you're able to, you know, ship software and deploy it, um, you know, on a daily basis or even multiple times a day. Uh, that's the type of thing that gets unlocked through through cloud migration and, and kind of the digital, the digital quotient, right? So, um, you know, that, that can factor into it. Yeah, and I, I think it's the same. It's right. It's, it's, you can see the results of it, right? If it's there. Um, yeah. You know, I think, yeah, like what we talked about very early on was like, you know, experimentation, right? Like if, if you're seeing that your organization can, you know, experiments a lot and does these kind of blameless postmortems, right, and, and and is capable of trying out new things, that that's an indication that that it's there. If you're not, right, then that starts to become a, a challenge or you know a problem, right, in in ways in yep. which you, you may want to try and adjust. Uh, okay, well, yeah, I, I think we're way over time, and I, I do appreciate everyone staying on. I, I, I've really enjoyed the conversation. Hopefully, you have too. Um, you know, if there's additional questions that you have, feel free to reach out to us at the email that we have here, um, and you know, we'd be happy to respond to them, and you know, and have longer um, conversations to talk about any any of these or um, you know trends that we're seeing in the marketplace, how they affect your business individually. And, and so really just appreciate everybody um, and their time today. Hopefully you enjoyed the wine, the conversation, and uh, looking forward um, to speaking with you all again very soon. So thank you very much and happy holidays, everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Happy holidays, everyone. Thank you.